Good afternoon and welcome back to Student Hub Live, our education, childhood, youth and sports curriculum showcase. Well, we've got some new people joining us and some people who've been sitting with us for well, the last few days, actually, as we've been broadcasting a range of things all about the Open University. Um, so my name's Karen Foley, for those of you who don't know me, and uh, we've got some fantastic guests lined up for you this afternoon. And I've got a sneak preview for some very important people I'd like you to introduce you to, because one of the things that we know know about Student Hub Live is that it's so wonderful to see and hear people often behind the scenes at the academic institution of which we're all a part. So in addition to the academics presenting their research, I'd like to introduce you um, to Fari Kachalan, who is our um, Executive Dean of Wells and Professor of Wellbeing. And uh, she's quite new to the Open University. So Fari would really like to know how everyone is feeling right now. So we've got some widgets there, if you could fill those in. Those are um, word clouds, so you need to put one or two things in, or three if you can think of them. You need three boxes, though, put a full stop in if you can't think of a third thing, otherwise the results won't submit. And let us know how you're feeling about anything today. We also have um, uh, Eric uh, Ad Adaya Kramara here today, who has worked tirelessly on putting this program together um, and uh, has been very much behind the scenes here doing this. It's very important for our students to feel part of a community. So welcome, Eric and Fari. How have you uh, enjoyed the program today, Fari, so far? I've enjoyed it. Um, I haven't been able to watch as much as I would have liked to, but I was watching a session on the a new multidisciplinary dissertation module and um, a lot of great information, a lot of great questions. It was sounded sort of complicated, so I think it was really great that the students had the opportunity to interact with the academics and ask those questions. So I found it really helpful. Brilliant. That's wonderful. And Eric, you've been watching avidly um, since you put most of this yeah. together with various colleagues. Yeah. What have you yeah. enjoyed? I've been impressed with, um, with, with all the sessions, um, if I'm being honest. Um, um, at, at the level of engagement on the chat box, where you know I've been sort of working behind the scenes, uh, demonstrates how engaged our, our audience are. Um, the questions that have come through all the way from students wanting to know how to communicate or build academic and professional networks has worked. I mean, there's been examples in terms of how students could actually set up their own Twitter accounts, um, participate in blogs, either reading or, or, or wanting to publish their own work on blogs. Um, the session with Ben and Caroline was fantastic. I mean, I enjoy that so much, especially with the myth busters, um, but, uh, and particularly when when it, when it's okay for young people to start um, con strength conditioning and resistance training. I think was a great myth, bu myth buster for me because I, I would have thought no, you'd have to hit around 14, 15 before they do any sort of resistance training. But I know that's only a myth. Um, and the session with Anthony and Naomi have also been very, very insightful in terms of working with, uh, with, with, with young people. And finally, as Faris said, it was great to have Martin and Alison on as well to unpack the multidisciplinary um, dissertation um, as well. Because, I mean, picking up from the questions that came up during that session from students, I think it was very necessary for them to, to, to share the insights um, in terms of what they're planning to, to offer um, in October. Brilliant. Thank you, Erica. Very great synopsis there. Now, Fari, you're new to the um, Open University, well, relatively new, and uh, you've described yourself as a serial meeting goer and emailer. Um, and so it's rare that you get the opportunity to, to spend time with our wonderful students. But building an academic community is really, really important. Can you share your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, what's unique about the OU is that we do do everything at a distance and we do it really, really well. But um, we also are able to build and keep the academic community going um, through events like this. And that's really important. It's really important to have venues and opportunities regularly where our students, our academics, our stakeholders can come together like they are um, with the Student Hub Live and just share ideas, answer questions and have those interactions that we would have um, in any other, you know, work or educational setting. So I think, I think it's really important. And like I said, the OU is really good at doing this kind of thing at a very high caliber. So I'm always impressed um, with what I see and um, just always wish that I could participate in it more 
and that there was enough time in the day, you know, to do more of it. Um, but I think they're really important events. Um, and they also take a lot of effort from everybody, which when it's so fantastic, it looks really seamless. <laughs> like it looks like we just all popped up out of bed and uh, just sat in front of our computers, but there's just a ton of work that goes into it. So I'm always impressed at how dedicated my colleagues are and the students as well and everybody else in terms of getting these things together. So it's a yeah, lot of good work. No, absolutely. Well, I'm glad you're not the only one because our students often have been saying, you know, they struggle with time management. I guess it's one of those issues for us all. We all wish we could have more time to, uh, you know, spend doing things we enjoy. But it's all it's all a balancing act, isn't it? It's wonderful, though, to it have is, some definitely. time to, to, to reflect on what amazing work colleagues are doing. And, and I love working with the school to really explore some of the issues and debates and pieces of research that are there right now. So, Fari, you'd asked how everyone's feeling. Let's see um, what they had to mm -hmm. say about what was exciting our people at home right now. Uh, so let's see, what are you most excited about right now? Learning is the key thing that's coming through here. Meeting cool. other students. Um, having fun and learning, getting a degree, early childhood, um, becoming an expert, um, a biology assessment. Somebody was here for their biology assessment earlier. We hope it's gone well. <laughs> um, a new career. So very often people are looking at teaching, etc., learning, interacting, new challenges, myth busters, meeting students is, is a really key thing and exploring various interests, reaching my end goals. So some really positive things, fun and learning, community, yeah. new friends, development. Wonderful words there. Eric and Fari, how, how does that make you feel seeing what's exciting people at home right now? Really pleased because, I mean, all the things that we see on there is basically what the OU is about, um, both our academic and professional uh, um, services are here to ensure that the learning experience is, is, is the best we can provide for our students. So I'm not surprised learning seems to be one of the key things, but all the other, other bits that I mentioned um, are, are very important for us. Mm, absolutely. And Fari, I mean, hearing from students is really important. You were saying that at many of your meetings, you have student voices, um, you know, representing what students think you love knowing, what they're enjoying, what they'd like to know more of. And it's something that um, is so important to us at the Open University, that student voice. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about working with students and um, maybe how students might get involved with the school? Um, yeah, I'm definitely. I mean, I think the more students can get involved, the better, because the more voice that they have, the stronger their voice is, the better for us, um, because that's what we want to do ultimately is, you know, give the best experience possible to our students. So I would say um, through the Student Association, um, you know, uh, being um, an active member of it, uh, joining um, activities, uh, joining elections, uh, joining as many committees as possible, uh, meetings <laughs> as you can. But it's also an educational opportunity, I think, for our students um, and something that's a CV builder as well, those kinds of activities. So, um, mm -hmm. But um, just through the student association to get involved as they possibly can, if there are any kind of events that we hold, like through Wells, we've tried to hold events where, um, you know, when we've met with students or had forums. So please attend, even if it's just for a little bit. Um, email, um, feel free to email your thoughts, um, your ideas, your comments, uh, criticisms. So so I think just um, help us keep lines of communication open um, and two way so that it's not just us talking to students, but students also talking to us. So I think any level of involvement from our students, but as many students as possible is the best thing. Absolutely, because so often people think, well, I'm only just a normal person or I'm not a normal person. I'm really struggling. But if we don't know some of those things, it's very difficult to, to make changes, isn't it? Well, that's wonderful. Well, thank you very much for popping in. I shall leave you both to go back to your meetings. And Eric, you're going to hang around and uh, participate in the chat. But lovely do. to meet you, Fari. And we'll see you um, at our induction event that we'll do for our students um, in September time uh, as they start their new modules. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, our next guest, um, this is a very exciting you. conversation. Thank you both. Um, I'd like to introduce you to um, Amber Fenton-Smith, who uh, is going to be doing our next uh, debate. So we've picked up some key issues. Welcome, Amber. You're looking particularly wonderful Hello. in your orange today. Um, so oh. you are going to talk about debates fit for purpose, um, key debates and alternative education. So this is a very interesting session and something that we were talking about um, a little bit today, but in quite a different context. So, you know, I was saying oh, I'm homeschooling. I mean, I'm sort of shouting various maths instructions while my daughter's here in lockdown. But actually, we were very mindful that this term wasn't always appropriate to use. So can you sort of describe what alternative education actually is? 
Of course. So education, learning um, happens in many diverse spaces and communities. And when we talk about alternative education, um, there might be different forms of provision that are connected to some degree to formal schooling. So um, it can include democratic schooling, pupil referral units, and perhaps the most um, unstructured of those, um, home education. Okay, so why do people do this? I mean, what motivates people? I guess, you know, some of us don't have a choice right now in terms of what's happening, but in normal times, what, what might motivate people to consider such a choice? At of course, well, the, the reasons I think are, are very individual and they vary from family to family. Um, and equally, as parents, the longer they spend time home educating, their reasons change as they reflect and learn from their practice. But if we think about it as a learning journey, generally, they're kind of two distinct points, starting points, if you like. And those parents who home educate from the outset, so those who don't um, ever choose to send their children to school, and those families who perhaps through um, their child's mental health and well-being and SEN provision have taken the route to deregister their children from state maintain provision. Um, a lot of them talk about um, wanting to restore to help and support their children's emotional um, and social well-being. Now your research um, found that there were two quite distinct starting points which might prompt this decision um, and they were um, about, um, uh, well, well tell us what those starting points were really and what you found in doing that. All right. Um, so I think um, parents who um, were in the sort of the group, the, the increase in the number of parents deregistering their children, um, lots of those children had experienced, as I said, declining um, mental health and well-being, um, perhaps maybe not having the degree of support to support their children's um, special educational needs. And so those parents, the ones who potentially felt pushed and that they didn't really have a choice so that it was framed as a kind of a last resort rather than something that was a, a positive um, lifestyle choice um, in comparison to parents who maybe had made the decision when their children were very, very young or sometimes even before their children were born. Now, there's a lot of debate in this whole area. I mean, you're sort of saying that, that for some people, I guess it's almost um, a choice that they're making because they might view the school as being a broken system, something that's not able to meet the needs of the family or the child. What are some of the key areas of debate around that particular issue? Of course. And I think when we when we frame this, we need to think about it being um, um, multiple sides of, of a coin, if you like. So, you know, there are exceptions to the rule, but um, generally some of the um, areas that parents have, have, have struggled with is um, class sizes and um, setting and streaming. So this idea that, um, you know, uh, children would benefit from um, interacting with, with wider groups of different um, children of different ages, particularly around the, um, the area in, in secondary curriculum, feeling as though learning in discrete subjects perhaps maybe is not as reflective as the way in which we learn in, um, in, in the outside world beyond school. At the younger ages around primary, um, there's some feeling that um, high stakes testing and SATs is, um, creates a, a, an undue pressure on children. Um, but it is important to think about, you know, um, the web, web curriculum in Wales, for example, is being radically reconfigured at the moment. And so thinking about these experiences across four nations are, are, are very, very different. Um, so I'm talking mainly about English policy here. Um, but importantly, this idea of wanting to provide a more personalised learning environment for children where children are able to pick and choose um, what they learn, when they learn and how they learn. And perhaps doing this in this environment does can offer for some children that that flexibility. Mm, mm, absolutely. Kieran, how is everyone doing at home and uh, how do people feel about this topic? Actually, it's really interesting because I'm going to segue a couple of things together here. Um, in the last session on fires here, along with Amber, um, I asked the students about how they felt things had changed uh, now that they were you know, in lockdown and, and studying the students. And often what came up was that issue of um, balancing family life with home education, which is very relevant. And specifically in Amber's session here, uh, you can see that the students are quite aware of that 
teachers and educated and schools, state run schools, do fantastic jobs. Uh, but that that's differentiated education. And as Amber has mm. pointed out there too, it's much more, they feel that when the, when the parent makes that decision to take the child out, it's to offer personalised education so they can change the, the timing, the speed, uh, what's being done. Uh, so basically what Amber's discussing has been quite relevant in the chat as well. Mm. Absolutely. Amber, can we talk about that? Yesterday we did a careers event um, and we were focusing on education. Mm. We were talking about um, the extent to which um, some people were inspired to become teachers as a result of, you know, there's been a huge insurgence in, in terms of inquiries. Um, and we were talking about the extent to which it was representative of teaching, having your child at home during the, the pandemic at the moment. I mean, how, how is that sort of viewed? How, how might we view teaching in this sort of time as representative of homeschooling any thoughts on that I, I I think it's really really difficult to say because you know the the the, the research or the evidence is, is is really emerging but the important thing to bear in mind is that if we, when we call this homeschooling um schools who um unless you deregister your child um, and you formally educate otherwise, schools do have a responsibility, um, an applied responsibility to support um, what we might call school supported learning at home, whether that's happening and what degree, what degree that is happening to uh, remains, remains to be seen. But um, home educators, as it were, who were home educating in normal times themselves are experiencing disruption in what they would call their own practice. And part of the problem with the term home education is that for many families, their practice, if you like, occurs within and across face-to-face -face communities. And many of these communities are set up by parents and occur in local village halls, um, museums, lots of different spaces to support their home ed practice. And some of um, some home, home educators and children at the moment feel as though that their education is being disrupted. So I think um, whilst there are important points of difference um, and um, similarity across those two types, we need to be sort of mindful in, in, in looking at ways in which this disruption has, has, has impacted a range of different uh, groups, um, definitely. Have you seen any um, impact of the pandemic on the way that people have conceptualised things, for example, online networks and, and how those might be used? Um, well, I think I, I, I haven't seen too too much coming out of that. I mean, th there's been some interesting research looking at engagement and learning outcomes at the moment. Um, I think the, the studies that have been published have focused largely on how teachers perceive students' engagement at home. And I think what we need to be doing is making sure that we also capture parents' views of their children's engagement. And equally, um, I think we need to think about engagement and learning much more broadly. Um, so, for instance, you know, if, if a child perhaps hasn't been engaged in um, following one aspect of a, of a, of a task set, set online by their teacher, what other activities might have they been doing at home? And um, I think one of the things about home education and educational alternatives more broadly is they give us a vantage point to open up really how we understand and think about education much more broadly. And one of the things that I hope that, that happens when policymakers and academics start to talk about the impact of, um, of home learning, whatever we call it, that we think about this through multiple different vantage points. And of course, there's, there's going to be um, really important questions related to the digital divide. Um, just another point that I would make um, that links to my um, my, my second point is that um, it's not an easy home education in normal times is not an easy choice and often it's represented in the media in, in an extremely polarized way um, it involves it, it huge changes to family life um, what, what we do know is that mothers often assume the lion's share of responsibility for their children's home education it involves changes to careers and working patterns and so it's not something that many parents do lightly um, and I think um, you know if we think about the this in a, in a it's important for us to think about this critically and through a number of different lenses
because there were a lot, a lot more costs associated with it. So you're researching this whole area, Amber. Just, just to end then, what, um, what are some of the, the key questions that you've got um, that, that might be useful to give us a more full understanding of home education in the future? Well, I think also the, the, the context of this um, pandemic schooling or school supported learning at home might be really helpful for broadening and enhancing areas that we, you know, how we think about and understand home learning more broadly. And so I think there's important crossovers for us to, to look at. Um, but we also don't know enough about home education. So um, there's not any kind of um, wide scale quantitative data and this makes policy making very difficult. Um, it's very difficult um, to talk about the experiences of, for example, gypsy and traveler families, um, Muslim and home educators and other, other groups who aren't represented in, in the research. And so this is really important in terms of policy making, um, but also we need to think about you know, other areas, resource implications, um, such as the digital divide to get a fuller picture. But all of these things require us to move beyond um, a, a really polarized understanding of better than school or worse than school um, actually it's just it's just different brilliant and um, but a fascinating area Kieran let's just uh, pop over to you quickly for our final thoughts from the audience uh, <clears throat> yeah um, there's some really good talking on here I mean there's a lot of uh, parents in the audience and uh, they've been mentioning things on here about you know uh, children who may uh, have autism or have different learning mm. needs and sometimes they need the structure of school and then sometimes it can also be a huge disadvantage. Um, I'm going to do a shameless plug for Amber here because uh, Amber and I know each other outside of us and Amber does a very good blog on homeschooling so those students who are in here today and are interested in that I'd definitely go and have a look at some of Amber's work. Uh, it can be very revealing. And you should read Kieran's article on his uh, dabblings with home learning. <laughs> <laughs> and they are dabblings. I mean, Amber's an expert. I'm a beginner. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm I'm a quitter at it. I just can't wait until the kids can go back to school. <laughs> but, uh, Brilliant. Yeah, six to the day job. Uh, yeah. Um, so I'm a really fascinating talk. And thank you, Kieran. Um, we're going to continue um, some of this uh, discussion in our next session, um, which is going to focus on lockdown and child development with John Oates. But before that, we're going to give you another of our campus tours, um, which is the beautiful Legacy Garden. So I'll see you for that next session. Thanks so much, Amber. Bye for now.